jewelry, tradition, business, and so much more. Hi, I'm Regina Gershman. And I'm Dr. Sam Dubé. Together, we're going to take you on an extraordinary journey with engaging people from around the world, starting from right here in Ottawa, the capital of Canada. In this episode of The Etiquette Show, Stacy talks to an amazing New York City author. Following her interview, Dr. Sam Dubé interviews Bernadette about lesbian dating. Hi, I'm Stacy White, and you're watching The Etiquette Show. Today I'm joined by award-winning documentary filmmaker and photographer, Peter Boussain. Hi, Peter. Thanks for joining The Etiquette Show. So today we're going to be discussing your book, Trans New York, Stories and Photographs of Transgender New Yorkers. So for those unfamiliar with this book, can you tell us what compelled you to put together this amazing um, catalog of photographs and stories of transgender New Yorkers? Sure. First of all, thanks for having me on your show. I'm very uh, honored to be here. Um, so they, you know, basically it was because I just felt like there was this population out there that was not um, being represented. And uh, I'm, you know, very curious why, why I haven't heard more st stories from trans people themselves. And you get a lot of people, you know, who have opinions on trans people and trans lives. Uh, mm -hmm. And, uh, but I hadn't heard much from them personally. So the okay. point of the book was to do portraits and tell their stories. Uh, so that was the primary reason for doing it. Okay. And why did you choose New York as the backdrop for the story? Why trans New York and not trans Wisconsin? Something like sure. that. Yeah. Well, the first reason is, uh, yeah, I live here. Okay. <laughs> so that, that was, uh, you know, if I lived in Wisconsin, maybe I would do trans Wisconsin. Okay. Um, however, I do feel like uh, New York uh, has a very special relationship with the trans community. Of course, you know, going back to, Stonewall and uh, the beginning of, uh, you know, beginning of really the LGBT movement, uh, right. and and in particular though also the trans movement. So New York has been a place because of its unique um, history of of being a melting pot from people from all over the world. And I would even go further saying, you know, because, I mean, there's no place on earth and I've traveled widely all over this planet. There is no place in the world like New York where you have so many different people from everywhere mixing and particularly in such a small environment. And that, right. that doesn't necessarily mean that New Yorkers are always uh, accepting of other people any okay. more than, than any other people and trans people experience a lot of um, uh, discrimination here, just like anywhere else. But I do feel like there is a unique quality in New York where because people are forced in a way to all live together, there's, there's a way in which people just kind of, um, at, at least if they don't embrace it, they just accept it. And, okay. And perhaps more than any place else that I've been to anyway. Okay. Great. And Abby Stain writes a fantastic forward in this book, and she describes this book as a milestone in breaking down stereotypes and outdated notions about transgender people. How does it feel to have your work described in this way, recognized for making history in the fight against transphobia? Well, that's the thing that I'm the most proud about this book. I'm, I'm you know, it would have been a complete failure of a book if it had not been embraced by Abby and right. the other people in that book and the trans community as a whole in New York. So that, you know, getting their support and their belief in the project and, um, you know, that has meant everything to me. So okay. if, if there's an audience outside of that, then that's fantastic. And, you know, the goal really of the book is to reach out to, um, not even so much trans advocates, uh, but to people who don't know much about the trans, you know, trans people okay. and even people who are skeptical. So, 
that that's definitely an audience I wanted to go after. But ultimately, if I didn't have um, the the support of that community in doing that, then I wouldn't have the book wouldn't have the legitimacy to even attempt that. Okay. And how did you go about finding subjects for the book? Uh, well, I knew a few people who knew trans people, particularly, you know, actors and people in the media profession. There are a lot of trans people who work in media. Uh, you know, it, t- it tends to, uh, you know, tend to be a lot of very creative people who are trans. So um, that's one right. thing I really noticed with this book. So uh, that's how I started, but that wasn't enough. So I also reached out on Instagram and okay. just started contacting people cold. Um, and it was interesting because when I started, people started talking to me about the trans community. And I didn't even know what that meant I, you know, I didn't know there was a trans community, but what okay. I realized is that there really is and that there are a lot of people who are connected, that they know each other. And so once you get into that network, um, you know, it just built from there. Okay. And did you find that anybody wasn't willing to participate? Anybody that you reached out to? Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And um, so in this book, each fic, each, um, Subject is featured with a photo, beautiful photos, by the way, and a basic, I would call them stats, like, um, you know, like a sports player stats, but instead we have stats about, uh, you know, where they're from originally, their hometown, which part of New York they reside in now, as well as um, their age at transition. What made you want to include the age at transition? Um, the, <clears throat> well, um we thought, you know, we just, I, I came up with this list of questions in collaboration with my publisher, who is okay. Apollo Publishing in, here in New York, and, and a, a colleague I've worked close with, uh, Julia Abramoff, who is the publisher. She, she edited a previous book of mine, Passage to Afghanistan, um, just to give them a little blurb. Um, um, but we came up with the list together, and I... You know, we didn't really necessarily exactly know all the questions we should ask even. And if I had it to do again, I wouldn't include that question. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because, and well, I'll tell you why, because, um, you know, many people, you know, well, many people and actually most people, I think, in their concept of being trans don't think there is a definitive time when they started transitioning. They've been you know, trans their entire lives. So, right. you know, age of what transition? When they started hormones, when they had a physical, you know, operation or surgery or whatever, or, you know, when they started living as, you know, their uh, their real sex. Uh, right. You know, what 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 is the marker of that? So that's right. a question that I wouldn't include if I did the book again. Okay, so that brings me to the story of Angela Torres. So she's based in bed uh, Brooklyn, and she stood out for me because when she was asked, uh, you know, what her age was at transition, she says that she doesn't align herself with the words transition as it implies that she went from one thing to another, you know, male to female. And so she prefers to say that uh, she began living her, authentic, her true authentic self at age 18. So... You know, as a society, we've made a lot of headway in, you know, equal rights for everybody. How close do you think we are as a society in removing such restrictive labels as, you know, transgender, et cetera, and just, you know, recognizing people for their authentic selves? Well, I think we've made a little progress, um, but I think there's a long way to go. I I think that... um, I, you know, I make the correlation between the trans movement now and the, the, the gay movement in the 80s when I really feel like it was m- mainstreaming. I mean, it was, you were seeing gay character, you know, out, out gay characters on right. TV, on Will and Grace and yes. you know, things like that. And all of a sudden it seeped into the consciousness of, you know, 
typical middle middle America, right? And that's right. where the, the trans, you know, trans people have to go. But right. it's not there yet. But it's okay. made a lot of progress in the last, uh, you know, even year and a half since I started this pro project. I mean, there are a lot. It's a lot more. You know, publicity, they're on television, right. they're right. shows, you know, all kinds of things like that. But that being said, there's also a great deal of pushback coming. Uh, and so that's, um, you know, that's just that, that battle that needs to be right. fought. Right, right. And so, you know, we've all heard of the dangers of the single story, you know, the story told by someone else and um, it's kind of like a stereotype or an assumption based on a person's race, religion, um, or even culture. You know, the LGBTQ community is often placed into a box of one size fits all based on stereotypes. How important was it for you to give these uh, subjects the ability to change the narrative by telling their own story as opposed to you just snapping pictures and just, you know what I mean, relaying the story yourself. Yeah. Well, it was completely important. It's hundred and hundred percent important. That's completely what the book is about. So okay. if it wasn't, if I didn't do that, then it would be a different book and a book that I didn't want to do. Right. Right. Okay. So I'm just going to show the book again to our viewers. And so this is a picture of Camilla Vasquez. Her her story is featured in the book as well. What made you choose Camilla for the cover? Well, actually, there was there were. Look, I'm not the publisher, so I don't know. But okay, they have well, but they have. Uh, no, they're in that business. They right. know what kind of a shot is gonna is going to be arresting and and right. you know a shot that's going to get people to stop and look and pick the book up and you know we have a lot of you know i think we have a lot of great shots in that book uh, this one in particular struck the publisher and she mm -hmm. said that's the shot right and actually camilla was one of the earlier people we photographed and there was never a shot that we really considered for the cover except that one okay wow yeah. okay so the media often portrays uh trans people especially women as having a certain aesthetic you know overly sexualizing them being obsessed with hair and makeup etc but this book like even the cover shows um shows them in a different light like um shows people almost this uh, camilla looks like the girl next door was this done intentionally Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I wanted to show them, um, as people before anything else, you know, it's, right. uh, and look, I mean, women also, you know, are, are held to all kinds of standards that, you know, they don't even necessarily want to, maybe they want to portray themselves that way, but maybe they don't, you know, and ultimately we're all just people. And then, right. you, you know, I wanted to get beyond the, beyond the image of, you know, a, a woman or trans woman in a certain way and get over it. And right. to just see these people as people beyond, uh, you know, their gender identity. And okay. you know, it's because they're also, you know, have all kinds of other interests. They, you know, are painters or they, right. love, you know, they, they raise poodles or they like old pickup trucks or who knows. Right. People with interests and talents and all kinds of things beyond that. And not until you normalize or regularize this gender piece, can you even look at that? Because, tr you know, the tr being trans oh, still overwhelms everything. People stop at that part. They, they're like, right. da, 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 trans. Oh, then they don't even get beyond it and see who that person is. So the last thing I wanted to do was, you know, play into stereotypes or, or uh, uh, you know, um, what's the word, standards of beauty that are constructs uh, from somewhere outside of who these people are. Right. So was there anybody who, you know, wanted to be all glammed up and didn't really want to have their photo taken without being all glammed up, so to speak? Of course. Find any pushback? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, of course. Okay. Okay. <laughs> you know, How did you overcome that? So, 
<laughs> Everybody, you know, wanted to look as, you know, trans women wanted to look as beautiful as possible. Right, right. And, you know, um, and by the way, it's only 50% trans women. It's right. 30% trans men and 20% non-binary. That's right. So, uh, so yeah, of course they did. Well, I had to, you know, explain to them that this is not a shoot for your modeling portfolio. Right. And, you know, if you get a couple of shots and you feel like you want to put them in there, that's fine. But that's not what this is about. And okay. so once they understood what the book was about, of course, they were very supportive. Right. Um, but, uh, look, everybody is vain and everybody wants to look as good as possible in pictures. So, and I even got people who didn't like their pictures. So, oh, wow. And, wow. and, in, and, in, and in one case, I redid them because wow. I kind of agreed with them. So we okay. redid it too. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Well, I really enjoyed looking at the photos in this book and reading the story. So, um, there are over 50 stories of accounts of, you know, everybody's journey to transitioning and, um, personal essays included in this book as well. So, I mean, I highly enjoyed the book. I learned so much from reading this book and I recommend this book to everybody, not just, you know, members of the LGBTQ plus community, but to everyone because everyone can learn a lot. You know, the climate that's going on, everybody would benefit from reading this book. So I highly recommend this book to everyone. Peter, what do you want the takeaway to be for everyone that reads this book? Uh, well, I think you just mentioned it. I think it's a book for everybody. And, you know, whether you're interested, well, look, I want to sell the book to anybody, right? But, yeah. <laughs> but even if you're not particularly interested in the trans issue or whatever yes. we're going to call it, um, the book has a good lesson, which is that everybody should go out there and live your most authentic life and yes. become your most authentic self. Uh, and we can all learn that from trans people because they're very in tune with that. Okay. Well, again, great book, fantastic pictures and portraits of individuals in this book. And this book is available at Amazon.com. It's available in all platforms. It's available hard copy, soft copy, as well as for e-reader. So, again, I highly recommend this book. And I want to thank you again, Peter, for your time today and for discussing this book with us. Thank you, Stacy. I, I enjoyed uh, meeting you and, and having this interview. Appreciate it. Thank you and take care. Bye. Bye. My name is Dr. Sam Newbay. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here today with Bernadette, whose Twitter is actually titled Lesbian Dating Problems. Bernadette, can you contextualize that for us, please? Yeah, you know, I actually changed my Twitter as kind of a joke um, because I've experienced after moving, I live in the United States in Florida. So after moving to Florida, um, at least South Florida, I've noticed a lot of different challenges that I never faced before when it comes to dating. The type of um, thing that people are looking for down here is a little different than what I'm used to. Uh, you know, you have a lot of couples that want to start in the bedroom. You have a lot of um, girls that aren't really sure, you know, am I gay, am I bi? So that's labeled bi-curious, and they just want to experiment. Um, and you have the ones that just want a one-night stand, you know, and it, it's, overwhelming how much of that is here and how little of it is people that actually want a relationship and are actually seeking some sort of a connection, which is why I'm still single, because it's next to impossible to find someone like me that wants a relationship. Um, now, when I go into meeting somebody, I don't say, will you be my girlfriend in the first five minutes of talking to them. Like, I really want to get to know you, so I'm not wasting my time and yours if you don't have the same beliefs, same um you know, I'm, I'm Jewish, and that's very important to me. So uh, if you don't have the same um, beliefs in how to raise a family, uh, I can date someone who's not Jewish. I, I'm, I'm sorry, my dog is part That's okay. Um, we had a cat crawling around here moments ago. It's cool. Okay. I hope they just don't see each other. That would be bad. Uh, he, he's done. 
Um, but I've only also dated people that aren't Jewish because it's really hard to find another Jewish lesbian, especially in South Florida where you think they'd be everywhere, but they're not. On JDate in 100 Miles, JDate is a Jewish dating um, website specifically for Jewish people. There's six of us in a 100-mile radius, including me. Yeah. It's a small pool. So let's, let's look at that a little more in your experiences with intercultural lesbian dating. Can you relate to us some of your experiences in that regard? Because you've been forced to, essentially, right? I'm sorry? I didn't hear uh, because you've been forced to, essentially, go beyond your 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 Jewish faith. And I'm, I'm very proud of my faith. Um, am I super religious? Absolutely not. I only go to synagogue on a holiday, and I don't think I've gone in a while. Um, so, but I, I really want my children to be brought up in the Jewish faith. I really want them to understand, you know, the story. Um, and the women that I've been with, and I was actually engaged to somebody that wasn't Jewish, and we talked about children, and we agreed uh, to celebrate both sets of holidays, you know, and it, it's nice, as a Jew, I don't have to fight with somebody whose family we're going to be on for the holidays. You get Christmas, I get Hanukkah. You know, it, it, it was nice. You want to do Easter with your parents? Great, let's go. Um, but we agreed to raise the kids as both and have them choose which one they, they would prefer. But that's really important to me is I want I wanted the kids to understand, and I don't have any children, obviously, but um, my future children, I wanted them to understand both. Because is everybody still, has a story. Isn't Judaism perpetu perpetuated in the, 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 the matrilineal? Uh, aspect in in the in the in the woman's line. So yeah. how does that manifest in a lesbian relationship? Um, when you're both women, it, it's it's a little more difficult. I mean, as long as you guys both agree on how you're going to raise the children before you take that step, I think that's really important. When we decided if we were going to have children, we were deciding if we wanted to adopt or if we wanted to actually, you know, excuse my joke, but go to a bank and make a withdrawal. You know what I mean? Like, go to a yes. stone bank. <laughs> I understand. I understand, of course. You both wanted to take turns um, carrying, you know, I would carry one and she would carry the other. Um, but, I mean, technically, the way it's written is if I'm having the child, then technically that child is Jewish. And if she's having the child, it would be whatever she is. But, I mean, I think it's important to raise the kids as both. It's a mixed family. And then gives them some aspect of choice down the road, as you were saying. Right. So let's go back to the uh, the intercultural dating experiences. Can you can you give us some examples of what you've you've experienced uh, in your dating life? As far as dating people that aren't Jewish outside or? of Judaism, yes. Um, I mean, it's pretty much the same. The only time where it differs is when it comes to a holiday. You know, I um. Personally, for me, I was not raised celebrating Christmas. I never celebrated Christmas. I had a Hanukkah bush. We didn't have Christmas trees. Um, I never celebrated Easter. So that was a big learning curve for me to experience all that. Um, I dated someone a couple years ago that forced me to have a live Christmas tree in my house. And as I am a, a germaphobe, not a germaphobe, a um, pain freak, uh, I, didn't, I wasn't a <laughs> fan of having, you know, those pine needles. needles on my floor. And now I have to spend all this money that I never spent before on a tree skirt and ornaments and getting the ornaments uh, monogram to say our first Christmaca because we celebrated both and, and put them together. Um, it, it, it was inexperience to get my dog not to lick all the staff off the tree. Uh, but, uh, not to mention the fire hazard. Correct. I mean, I, I am an open-minded person, so I'm willing to, to do things like that because I have to. As you said, I'm kind of forced into it because if I wait around for another Jewish lesbian that's feminine, which is what I'm, I'm into, more feminine women, it's never going to happen. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll grow old. I, you know, when I hear uh, in the lesbian community, the pool is very small and people start to get to know each other within a certain radius. So uh, that, that must be very difficult. Um, now, with regards to uh, people from other cultures, women from other cultures, did you have any positive experiences in, you know, investigating or experiencing other cultures as well? Did, did, was there an enriching experience uh, that you had that you can share with us? I mean, I, I, like I said, I learned a lot by um, being exposed to, I went to church. I had never been to church before. Um, 
So, and it was nice to sit through a service that was in English, you know, and, <laughs> not, <laughs> and not Hebrew, not Hebrew where you don't really know what you're saying. And, and, uh, you know, all the getting up and sitting down that you have in synagogue, it was just nice to have something a little different. Um, the songs were, you know, pretty enjoyable, but it's when you grow up like I did in that bubble of the Jewish religion and like I had Jewish holidays off of high school. So when I go to college and I say to my professor, hey, it's young Kipper, I can't come to class, or if he gives a test and it's a Jewish holiday, you know, it was very eye-opening for me to move to a town that was not mainly Jewish, and for the professors to say, that's not an excuse, I don't care that it's a high holiday, you have to take a test, yeah. You must be kidding. I was a university professor for over a decade. I always gave religious holidays to my students. It, it just... You have to be respectful. You you really do. So I'm very sorry to hear that, uh, Bernadette. I That's a uh... professor that told me it's not a real holiday. Oh. So did a dean. And uh, get... I you got away with that. Yeah. Honestly, well, like, I can't. I can't believe that. Yeah. And I, I just boggles my mind. Now, okay. Uh, how, how about some? This is good. How about some more? Um, man, I almost want to look at my Twitter to see what else is on there. Um, to anyone that that's listening or watching this, if you match with somebody, send the first message. Don't wait for them. I have so many times on my apps where we match and I never hear from that person. So I'll just take the first step and I'll send the message. And it's something stupid. Like, how was your 4th of July? Because I'm not great at openers either, but at least I'm opening the door. Let's have a conversation. A lot of these apps have icebreakers. They'll put the question in there for you and that you both answer it. Um, they'll, they'll do what they can to try and help it move along. But what is the point of matching with somebody if you're not going to say anything? I have a girl I just matched with on Bumble. Um, we have matched on three other apps. And oh. she even said to me, you know, we've matched a couple of times, but I can't, I don't remember why we, we never talk. And I said, yeah, me neither. How was your fourth? She answered me, asked me how mine was. I answered her. It's been three days. And now it. I know why we <laughs> we keep missing each other because she just stops responding. And so, in other words, she leaves you hanging after you sent a a message to her. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's unfortunate. No matter what your uh, gender. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm on. Um, I like I said, I'm on six apps because a lot of the girls out there will just go on one and not another one. This particular example I just used, she's on other apps. But sometimes you have girls that will only use Bumble or will only use Hinge or only use Tinder or Fur or things like that. But you always have to be careful of catfishes. I got catfish, but, you know, if you watch tell, tell us about that, Bernadette. Tell us about that. I had a girl match with me who claimed to be a Marine. Um, and I watch Catfish, the TV show. I'm also a little bit of a dork, computer dork. And so it's really easy for me to Google image search somebody um, and find out if it's a real person or not. Um, it's even easier when I start texting you. If you give me a phone number, then I can just Google your phone number and there you are. So I like to verify who I'm talking to is really them. This particular example, uh, this girl stole pictures from a girl that was in California who's straight um, and is with a guy is a Marine, so basically was stealing her valor, which is a felony in the States. Uh, and I confronted her about it, and she denied it, and was saying, WTF, that can't be right. And I'm like, give me your phone number then, because she only would give me her email address. I, she made me download Google Hangouts to talk. That's red flag. That's, that's 10 red flag. So She's trying to keep some relative anonymity. She wanted, yeah. she wanted to keep that tight. There's nothing chest. wrong with, with FaceTiming. There's nothing wrong with what we're doing. You know, especially with COVID, there are other ways to, to get to know someone. You know, I see these catfish episodes on TV where these people are together for years and they never pay, they never video chat. Don't waste your time. It's probably not a real person. My camera's broken. Look, look your camera's not broken. And if it is, use somebody else's camera, use someone else's phone. Where it's 2020. Where there's a will, there's a way, right? Where there's a will, there's a way. It's a camera. This, this laptop I'm talking to you on is five years old. It has a camera on it. 
Yeah, yeah, I don't want to tell you about my other laptop either. So, uh, it, just say it's ten pounds. We'll just put it that way. So, yeah, exactly. You kill someone if you hit them with it, and then it, it makes a really good bulletproof shield. Being a lesbian in this day and age is, is 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 tough enough. Although there are certainly opportunities that you may not have had, you know, fifty years ago. But again, that Twitter handle of lesbian dating problems. Can you tell us uh, more a little bit about what that brought you when you when you changed your Twitter uh, 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 name? Well, like I said, I, down here in South Florida, it's very different. Um, well, why? Why? Why do you think that is? I couldn't tell you. I don't know why this area, the Miami, Fort Lauderdale area, is like this. Um, I, I even tweeted something the other day that I just matched with a girl on, and I'm on like six apps, and that's another story, which I'll tell you in a minute. Yeah, but, please. Um, I matched with a girl a couple days ago, and on our second conversation, within the first 20 minutes, she asked me, and I counted before I spoke to you the other day, uh, 21 times she asked if she can meet me. Whoa. You have girls that will tell you. Yeah. It's a red a, flag? Red flag and scared me off. Um, I have girls tell me their fetishes, and I'm like, I, I don't know you. I don't. But thank you for telling me so I don't waste my time. But I don't know you for you to tell me what you like in bed or text me that um, you, you wish I was there. For me, I don't sext. Um, do you know what that is? I'm yes, sure Absolutely. I, I don't do that. Um, I just don't like it. I prefer to experience everything in person. I also think it's a spoiler to the end of a story. You know, if you're reading a book, you want to go on that journey with the main character. You don't want to read spoilers or cliff notes and know how it's going to end. I want to experience all of that. And so to say, I wish you were here and then play that sexting game of what we would do to each other, I think is so, I, I just personally don't believe in it. There could be people watching or listening to this that do. I personally don't do it. So, I mean, you're talking a little bit about what you would prefer and what you're experiencing. Can you elaborate a little more, Bernadette, on what else would be an ideal dating situation, environment, and, and even courtship for you? For me, I like to talk to, once I match with somebody on a site, I like to talk to them for probably a couple of days to a week before I've been, a, you know, set up a meeting, especially right now with COVID. It's next to impossible to meet with somebody. I actually saw the stats between Canada and the U.S., and it's like, Canada's doing it right. The U.S. is just out the window. And I'm in Florida where we're at, you know, 10,000 plus cases a day uh, right now. So it's really hard to meet somebody, and you've got to have a mask on, and, you know, you got to go to a place that's open. They just closed all the restaurants here. But in a perfect world, um, after – exchanging phone numbers and, and setting up a date, I like to meet in a well-lit public space so I feel safe. The person that I'm meeting doesn't know me, and they don't know from my background. Uh, I want them to feel safe and comfortable as well. I would never take someone to some trash bar, and I would never meet someone at a trash bar where you walk back to your car in an alley. You want each other to feel comfortable and safe, and that in this day and age is so important, especially to me. As I want whoever I'm with to, you know, be comfortable to talk to me. And, and if they want to flirt, let them flirt. But I don't want them to feel like I'm forcing them to do anything. So. And, and you mentioned also, Bernadette, being more attracted to more feminine women. Mm -hmm. Did you find any particular cultures that um, promoted that or there was more of a tendency for certain cultures to be represented by more feminine uh, lesbians than others? I haven't seen a specific culture that, that does that. Um, it, it just comes down to what you're comfortable with. Um, I'm just attracted to feminine women. I'm not attracted to the more masculine women, but that's just me. Um, one of my best friends is super feminine, more feminine than I am, and she's attracted to very masculine women. There's no rhyme or reason to it. She just is. And her girlfriend, I love her girlfriend. She, she and I have tons in common. I'm like, oh, if I could just find a feminine version of you, it would be great. And we joke about it all the time. That's cute. That's cute. Yeah. yeah. Um, so can you mention any humorous situations that you've been in during your dating career? Um, <laughs> the, yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's what, we, that's, that's what I like here. That's what I dedicated my Twitter to because it's just every time I experience something, and it, I mean, I don't know how, how open can I be on here. Yeah, open. Open. Just we will try to keep the language clean. Okay, I won't, I won't say anything bad. Um, I had a girl, 
uh, I, that I matched with that we, um, I think we were on our first conversation. Yeah, it was our first conversation. And she, like I said earlier, started asking me if I have any fetishes. And she's talking about her fetishes. And she asked me if I've ever been peed on. And I said, you know, no. Um, and I'm not interested in that. And she goes, oh, well, if we try it in a hotel room, we don't have to clean up after. Hmm. Wow. Next that, that, that cleanliness was the most important issue there, wasn't it? <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Wow. Okay. Uh, um, okay. What advice would you give to uh, someone in your situation then to avoid catfishing, to date successfully? Um, I'm clearly you've learned some valuable lessons here, and it's not just relegated to the lesbian world. But let's be let's be specific to your challenges and the lesbian dating world because you clearly know what you want, and you're not you're not experiencing it. And and you know I, I'm I'm getting hurt listening to you here. Like it really, it's it's uh, uh, my heart goes out to you because um, we're all people. We're all people. And we all uh, want to be in loving relationships, you know, and to experience this kind of uh, trouble and trauma. It just, it just doesn't seem fair nor right. So, what advice would you give to someone in your situation? We already talked about reaching out and answering the messages, you know. What else? I would say, you know, be honest. If you're not interested in somebody, don't ghost them. Don't lie and use some crappy excuse. I uh, have been told by a couple girls, um, oh, I'm getting back together with my ex, as, as the line to get out of uh, going out again. Just tell me, you know, I, it was nice meeting you, but I'm not interested. It's not going to work, but thank you. There's nothing wrong with being honest, um, especially after you meet that person, if you're getting that vibe that you're not interested. Be honest, be open, um, be honest about what you're looking for. You know, I have, I think one of the first things I put on my Twitter is put honest pictures up. There's so many pictures of girls that just have their Snapchat filters on. You can't see what they look like. And I don't swipe on any of those girls because I don't know what you look like. I so you're sending a like. message to those girls. Be more clear. Don't, yeah. don't falsely advertise, right? You want to, if you think it's cute to have, you know, a, uh, rabbit ears or bunny ears and like a little nose or whatever in a picture fine but have other pictures of what you really look like if you are hiding who you are and hiding what you look like and hiding your personality what's it going to be like when you actually meet someone and they decide, they see that you've been lying that's very deceitful and misleading thing to do you, you want them to know who you are i have i don't know yeah you can see in this closet i have Three shelves of board games. Because I love board games. I love card building games. I love that stuff. And I, I'll show pictures of it to whoever I'm, I'm talking to. Like, I want to teach you. I want you to have things in common with me. I'm not going to force you. But if you're into something like that, I can't wait to show you. But some people hide that, that part of them. And it gets them into trouble. And I've been in those situations. I was in a very... A traumatic relationship a couple of years ago because I hid certain things about myself and then when it came out it was not good. Was oh, not is there anything you can talk about or you'd rather not talk about it? Um, it ended in a legal battle so I would rather not. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I'm that's fine. I won so it was great. Okay, well that's good and you escaped uh, more or less with your skin intact, right? Yeah. But the emotional trauma, that uh, that's something that takes much longer. It, it was um, it was very traumatic. I did go to therapy after. Um, you know, it was just there were a lot of nerdy, dorky things about me that I wasn't completely honest with how much I was into certain things, and the other person was not into it. And when they found out I was into it, I got made fun of for it and degraded for the things that I liked. You know, whether it's Star Wars or you know Disney things. Um, I'm a big nerd, and I uh, too. I'm an yeah. Uber nerd. I say Uber nerd. Uber, Uber nerd. So, Uber nerd. I mean, I, my apartment is filled with Star Wars and Disney things. And um, when more of those things started to appear, the language started and the... the oh, no, you got to be kidding me. You, you were per persecuted for your, your, your beliefs, essentially, your right. hobbies and your beliefs. I was a huge Star Wars fan until the last that sequel trilogy came out. Boy, oh, boy, that, that, that <laughs> second movie. I mean, don't even get me started on that one. But um, but no, I feel you. I hear you. I hear you. And uh, I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry you went through that. And uh, it's it's kind of hard to imagine that that would have that led to this kind of emotional 
blackmail, this kind of emotional torture because of hobbies and, and like your nerdiness? Like this is, it's unfathomable. I got made fun of a lot, but that's why it's really important to be honest with who you are. And if a relationship does end, I have picked out and every relationship I've ever been in that's ended, I have learned a lesson from every single one. And so like with that one, it's be honest about who you are. Um, but always try and find the bright side because the breakup sucks. You know, everyone gets sad after a breakup. But if you try and find the bright side out of it and, and the lessons you can learn from it, um, then you'll be a better person for it. And you'll know what you want. I mean, I've been through enough. I told you I was engaged. I, I've been in long-distance relationships. I was in a relationship with a girl that had a child. Like, I've, I've tried as much as I can just to get that experience so I can really hone in on exactly what I want out of life and out of a partner. It almost sounds like you need to move from your current region in order to, to have a better chance at meeting someone of like mind. And I just moved here. <laughs> And you just got there. Oh my gosh, that's unfortunate. You know. So what what does the future hold for uh, Bernadette, the very sincere uh, lesbian who's had an array of experiences, including being catfished? Uh, what does the what does the future hold for you, Bernadette? What do you think the future holds? Well, I'm trying to meet people in different ways. You know, a lot of people are saying that you shouldn't do online dating, how hard it is, and I can attest to that. Um, so I've joined, uh, actually run a couple of meetup groups, um, in this area, you know, in, in my specific region, in my city, there's not a lot of young people my age that like to do what I like to do. Um, you know, a lot of it's like, let's go to Panera Bread and play Canasta. So I started my own group, um, where we do like axe throwing bars, um, escape rooms, yeah, it's fun. Um, drag queen bingo, drag shows, um, just just to meet people because I am in in my industry. It's really hard for me to just meet people in general, especially my age. Um, so I'm trying to get out there and just make more friends. So I just moved here um, and, and do whatever I can. I have an LGBT networking group on there. I have the one I just told you about. I have a game night group. I try and hold tournaments on some of the games that I have in that closet. Um, that I used to do all the time in Central Florida. Um, so I'm, I'm trying different ways, but I am trying to get out there. I'm not sitting here twiddling my thumbs waiting for, you know, Miss Wright to just knock on my door. I understand. How much do you think ulterior motives or agendas play in the lesbian dating arena? Because you're talking about catfishing, you're talking about people not being honest, you're talking about, I mean, these are things that could apply to any domain in dating. But but how much do you think it applies to the, the lesbian dating scene where, you know, it sounds like you're having more bad luck than good luck. Yeah. Because you're encountering all kind of dishonesty and, and like you mentioned, the catfishing, not returning messages, ghosting. Ghosting is one I find difficult to understand. You know, um, um, ghosting. Why can't you just... Uh, man up or woman up or, you know, and just say, you know, I'm sorry, I'm not interested or, you know, like it, it doesn't take much, but how much do you think validation plays in all this? I actually, you asked me earlier for a story and I have a story yes. about ghosting for you yes. that I ghosted someone because I was left with no choice. Okay. The girl that I matched with, um, who we were, I'm trying to think how to make this PC for this. Um, we were talking for a while, and she wanted my phone number. She wanted to text me. And that's, like, my rule number one, don't do that. And I broke it, and I gave her my phone number, which was mistake number one. Um, she and I started talking, and then all of a sudden she calls me. I'm not mentally prepared to have this phone call, <laughs> so I didn't really want to answer the phone, but I did. And we talked, and all of a sudden the, the phone call took a huge left turn into her fetishes, which I didn't ask her about, I didn't prompt her to say anything, um, but she was very detailed in certain sexual things she wanted me to do to her and vice versa, which automatically I'm like, I'm, I'm done with this phone call. Um, and then she told me how much she loves Jesus and that she doesn't approve of me being Jewish um, and that she wants me to convert. And I was like, no. And I, I was honest with her on the phone call. I said, I don't think this is going to work. So I'm going to go ahead and hang up now, but um, I hope you find what you're looking for and have a lovely evening. And I hung up. Um, block, block call? Block, block call? I didn't Is... block her yet. Okay. <laughs> that came um, the next morning. I woke up to 54 text messages 
and seven missed phone calls. Then I blocked her. <laughs> um, and some of them were like, I'm, I'm okay with you being Jewish. I'll be your Jewish princess and things like that. She didn't leave me any voicemail, but she left me, and I have a screenshot of it, 54 text messages. Wow. And I had no choice. I had to block her and ghost her because I had said to her, stop. And she actually, I missed the step. She was texting me after I hung up with her. And the ex, the one that I was talking about a few minutes ago that was very traumatizing, she was the kind of person that would constantly text and text and text until I would answer or constantly call and call and call until I would answer. And this girl was giving me, um, it was triggering to the feelings I had from that past relationship. And I asked her to stop and I told her that she was triggering me and it was giving me anxiety, which I, I never had before that relationship. And she didn't respect that. And that's when I put my phone down. And then the next morning, I woke up to those text messages and phone calls. And that's when I blocked her. Because I, I asked her nicely. And I said, you are giving me anxiety. You need to stop. And she just wouldn't. Uh, so I stand corrected on the ghosting thing. I should contextualize that a little bit. There are certain situations where if you're feeling that you are in danger, uh, that that's really the only logical way to go. I think there's there's certain... So I should have said that from the beginning. But under normal circumstances... I mean, ghosting is not at, at all. I mean, I, I, I could go on. I have lots of stories for you. I mean, um, there are... Because... This day and age, people are weird. And I told you earlier, you can just Google somebody's number. But if you're not careful with the information that's available online, if I Google your number, I can find all of your social media. I can find out where you live if your number is registered to an address. So I have a Google Voice number, and I usually give that when I'm trading numbers with somebody so they can't stalk me and find me and and uh, find all my information. If I'm not ready for you to know my last name, which I usually don't give them until at least trade social media, mm -hmm. um, I don't want you to have my real phone number. So I give them a Google Voice number. And, and so that's some kind of extra security you could look into. Google Voice is free. You pick the phone number, um, and that way no one can track you down. But not everybody does that. I do it for my, my safety. Wow, uh, you've been through a lot uh, for someone so young. <laughs> but you're you're genuinely looking for uh, for love, you know, and like 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 the rest of us. And uh, you know, there's a sincerity and an honesty about you. I mean, you practice what you preach. It's very clear. Yeah. You, know, I, you know, my ideal person is somebody that doesn't do drugs, which eliminates seventy five percent of <laughs> South Florida. Um, <laughs> <laughs> You smoke, you laugh, but it's true. Um, I don't want anyone that smokes anything. If it's for medical purposes, obviously, I, you know, I'm not an asshole. Excuse me, I'm not a jerk. Um, so, fine. But I would prefer someone that doesn't smoke. My ex fiance smoked cigarettes, and I could smell it in her hair. Oh, you know? yeah, that's something that I can't talk. I feel it in my eyes first. Yeah. My eyes water constantly. I just can't, well, can't deal with it. I would prefer not to be with that. I, I dated an alcoholic, so I look for warning signs. If I go out with someone and you have more than two or three drinks and you can't walk back to the car, that to me is alarming. Um, I don't drink a lot. I drink a Bud Light, um, which I know people are like, oh, that's not real beer. But that's not <laughs> yeah, right. I'm just and, thinking. Uh, and I'm Canadian, right? So it's like beer? That's yeah. cool. Yeah. I, I just don't drink. I, I babysit my beers. I'm very famous for that with my friends because they'll see how much I've gotten through. I, I'll barely finish one because I just don't like the taste of alcohol. And to me, drinking is not the way I like to have a good time. I like to spend time with my friends. Do what I said earlier. Go to an axe throwing bar. and Let me drink and do that. Um, you know, an escape room, anything, game, game night, something. I want to remember my evening. I, don't I, I love that, drinking and axe throwing. They actually allow that here. Be, to, we drink and axe throw at the same time. Yeah, so, and yeah. I don't, that's not safe. That's not safe but, no, no, it's not, but it's it's cultural maybe. I don't know. But <laughs> but anyway, yeah, no, please go on. Um, But like what I just said, literally just no drinking and no smoking eliminates so many people. Um, everybody's different. Everybody has a different type they're looking for. I am not a big fan of tattoos. In the Jewish religion, um, I can't be buried in a Jewish cemetery if I had a tattoo. Oh, really? Correct. I think I something uh, to that effect. That's it. very interesting. 
So I don't have any tattoos. Um, I would prefer to be with someone who doesn't. But again, now that eliminates eighty percent of Florida. Well, well, yeah, because if you marry a, a woman who has tattoos and you want your children buried with you and your spouse, how is your spouse going to fit into a Jewish cemetery with tattoos? The only way you can do it is getting cremated together or something. But like, it, it's. It's difficult. I mean, my ex fiance um, did not have any tattoos, um, but I think it goes with tattoos. I just don't like sleeves. I, I'm fine with a couple, but I want to see your skin. I, I, you know, I, I don't personally, you know, I don't want to offend anyone. Um, I don't like sleeves or tattoos. No, you're allowed to have your preferences, right? Um, so, yeah, I mean, just those those three things, drinking, smoking, and tattoos, it, it's just difficult. But I like someone that has a good background, someone that has a good job. I have financially supported an ex in the past. I don't want to do that again. I want my equal. I want someone that's my partner. And it's, it's harder and harder to find. I matched with someone the other day. And she messages me once a day. And we'll see. <laughs> She's a nerd like me, so I'm hoping it turns into something. But it's Day three, our third conversation, so I'm trying not to get ahead of myself, but lesbians have that stereotype that we move very fast. Have you heard those jokes about us, about our uh, Yeah, I, I think I've, I've been privy to some, but you can, you can please elaborate on that. There's a joke, what does a lesbian bring on their second date? A U-Haul? Oh, <laughs> yeah, I think I've heard something like that, okay. <laughs> And, um, with my job in my industry, I was um, paying to be in a pride parade here with my company. And as a joke, we were going to rent a U-Haul oh. and we going to have T-shirts and things. Like Some lesbians think that's funny. Some don't, but some do. It's kind of like a 50-50. Some get offended very easily by that. Um, I thought it was funny because I, I love comedy and I, I think it's hilarious. And it wasn't even my idea. It was someone else's idea. Let's get, that's a lesbian, let's get a U-Haul and let's get shirts with our names on it and people won't forget us and let's throw out our shirts and we'll put, you know, U-Haul with us and, and our company name. And, right. Um, Good for which, business. Yeah, the really about the domain, something about U-Haul with us. That's not the website name, but um, I don't know what it is because we don't use it, but she wanted to buy it so we would have it. Did you get any backlash for that? Pride got canceled. Because of COVID. Oh, right. Yeah, you know, I'm still struggling with the, with everything. It's a big blur, you know, so that's unfortunate. We were supposed to be in Palm Beach Pride and the Fort Lauderdale Pride. And Fort Lauderdale was um, Pride of the Americas, and it was supposed to be the biggest Pride event in the country. And they were having it in a different city every year, and it was supposed to bring in hundreds of thousands of people. And it was a big event, and it, it cost us thousands just to have a booth. And... Um, it only cost us that much because we wanted a booth in a specific location, <laughs> but right. um, we wanted a good spot. And Did you get a refund at all? Was there yeah, any? We got all of our money back. I'm sorry. We got all of our money back. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Wow. It, well. It yeah. No kidding. So I'm thoroughly enjoying this discussion with you. I have to admit, Bernadette, and um, we're gonna we're gonna have to wrap this up there. But is there anything else you would like to add? I'm giving you the platform right now. Is there anything else you would like to add to increase awareness? Is there there, there anything else, any more advice you'd like to give? Is there a message that you would like to give to uh, anyone, anyone out there, any particular group, be it, be it lesbians of your age group, be it anyone? I needed the platform. We are very lucky, um, my generation, because we can come out and it's not, you know, a shameful thing. Um, my parents were not the most welcoming when I first came out. Now they are so accepting. They're allies. They love my ex-fiance like a daughter. Apparently after we broke up, my mother sent her this huge farewell email. And she and it was really, really touching. I didn't know she did that. Um, but we are very, very lucky in it. And I think that um, it's, it, it is hard to find, you know, people to be with. Uh, you just got to be completely honest with what you're looking for and make sure you really trust the person before you invite them into your bedroom and um, make sure, again, that you meet at a well-lit public place. Don't invite someone to your apartment if you don't know who they are. You don't know who they are, where they're coming from. It's just even really their picture. We see stuff on the news all the time. 
just use common sense um, on where to meet somebody. And we said earlier, my, my Twitter is lesbian dating problems. You can always find me and ask me questions if you want. Um, I, and read what I'm going through. I, I, I try and post every day because something happens to me almost every day <laughs> um, with these girls. And it's, it's I, I've been single for two years. I have not been in a relationship. I, the most dates I've gone on, I went on three dates with one girl. We didn't even kiss. You know, um, it, it's, I'm not, I don't want anyone to think I'm some kind of player. Definitely not. I'm looking for love. I don't want to go on a dating show. <laughs> I have no interest in that. I mean, maybe this is our dating show right here. <laughs> um, but who knows? Who knows what will come of this and then people being exposed to your Twitter. And uh, it's a it's a very uh, catchy uh, name, uh, Lesbian Dating Problems. And I, I really wish that uh, something comes of it for you. I really do. I sincerely do. I mean, I mean this was cool to get a message to do this today so um I, and i appreciate it and and um you know like i said you can always tweet me ask me a question if you want me to if you want to send me pictures of your profile i'll give you tips and pointers like don't say that on your on your uh on your thing you know um i'm just trying to think of what else i can say i mean i pretty much said everything i, I think i wanted to say about dating it, it's hard it's very hard and for someone like me who doesn't fit the stereotypical look of a lesbian, um, which I've been told by many people, and I'm also into women that don't look like the stereotypical lesbian. It's very hard for us to meet people, and that's why I'm online. That's why I'm on so many apps. But hopefully I'll meet a genuine person too. <laughs> I hope so. I really do. I really do. I, I, I really enjoy this interview, Bernadette, and I, I wish you all the best. And uh, I, I will stay in touch with you. And I want to thank you for participating today from the bottom of my heart. And I think this was a very enlightening interview. And I think we got a chance to, to, to get some insight into the human being who is Bernadette, the sincere human who is looking for love, Bernadette. So for that, I thank you. And I, and I wish you all the best and to stay safe. Um, I'm Dr. Sam Duve. Call me Sam. And uh, Bernadette, it's been an honor and a pleasure. And uh, uh, we'll stay in touch, okay? All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. So just stay on the line and we'll just bid adieu to our viewers. Thank you and uh, everyone stay safe. You know, a lot of people think that when you watch TV, it takes thousands of dollars in order to produce a show. But Eminem has proved to me that with a small team, you can make big things happen. I have taken every workshop. Editing labs were amazing. They will help you with those first few shows to get you up and running. The best thing about my education at Eminem is that it's never going to stop. I called my mother and thanked her for bringing me to this country because there is this and I get to do this. Find out how you can get involved. Visit Eminem.org slash education.